How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Well, it's Thursday here on this program, and you know what that means. We have a lot to talk about here today, and uh, a lot of it's good. I mean, we got the Dynamite Report. We had an awesome main event, great opener, huge matches upcoming for AEW Dynamite, so we can tell you all about that. But we also have the bad news. Sammy Sitch alleged to have caused an automobile accident that led to the death of a 75-year-old man, according to documents obtained by TMZ. Incident occurred on the evening of March 25th along U.S. Highway 1. Sitch was driving a 2012 Mercedes, collided with the rear of a 2013 Kia Sorento that was stopped at a stoplight. The driver of the Kia was transported to the hospital where he later died. Following the impact, the Kia Sorento then crashed into the back of a 2011 GMC Yukon, which had been stopped at the stoplight. The occupants of the Yukon complained of back and neck injuries were not transported to the hospital. Two witnesses to the crash told police Sitch was driving, quote, at a high rate of speed. Police responded to the scene, suspected she was operating her vehicle under the influence of alcohol. Blood sample taken. Results are pending. 49-year-old has already been arrested twice in 2022 for separate incidents. Arrested in February for DUI and reckless driving. January arrested for allegedly having made death threats to a man while wielding a pair of scissors. Numerous DUIs on her record. Arrested for the offense three times in 2015. Sentenced to 90 days in prison. Further DUI charges stemming from incidents on January 23rd and February 2nd, 2018, led to her spending several months in prison. Arrested for DUI again October 2018. Eventually would serve over a year in prison. Released February 25, 2020, following her release, arrested for eluding a police officer, driving with a suspended license, sent back to prison, released June 9, 2021, and now, yes, a accident that resulted in the death of a 75-year-old. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. So continuing on with the... I don't know if... I don't know how to describe this. Nash Carter has been released from WWE. As first reported by Sean Ross Sapp, the 27-year-old has been let go following allegations of domestic abuse by his wife. Impact Wrestling's Kimber Lee. Photos of Lee with a swollen jaw allegedly caused by Carter were posted by her on Monday. Lee tagged the official NXT Twitter account in her tweet, along with the caption, Hey NXT, this is my face after your tag champ Nash Carter got wasted. Hit me so hard he split my lip open. He told me I'm a wrestler, so I'm always marked up. I've hid this for a year, even forgave him, but I can't hide it anymore. You all wanted the proof, there it is. I'm sorry I backed out, but he was telling me lies all weekend to get me not to say anything. A follow-up tweet reads... On Tuesday, Lee posted a photo of Carter dressed up as Adolf Hitler and giving a Nazi salute. She captioned the photo with, Just another look at the kind of person Nash Carter is. I've hid so much for so long because I was so mentally abused. Not to mention the countless anti-LGBTQIA plus statements him and his family make. And, uh, and that's the story. So, uh, where even to begin here? So... Uh, last week, I had heard that, uh, that Kimberly had posted something on Twitter, uh, some allegations, and then they were very quickly pulled, okay? And then, uh, I think that night was NXT. So, on NXT last night, or on, uh, la- it was last Tuesday. So, not this previous Tuesday, the Tuesday before WrestleMania. So they did a match, and uh, MSK was involved, and Imperium were the tag team champions. I could talk for hours about all of NXT, but Imperium were the tag team champions, and they were going to be defending at Stand and Deliver. So they did a multi-team person whatever match, and Nash Carter, one of the challengers, got pinned. So... I had heard that there was a tweet that got deleted. And so my, you know, obviously there's two things you think. Number one, you think, okay, well, they're going to win the tag titles on Saturday. That's why they did the job here. Or, you know, Stude's in trouble. So uh, he did the job and uh, I was half expecting like something's going to happen. You know, there was the tweet was deleted, but somebody's got to be looking into this. 
So uh, Saturday comes, and uh, the tag team titles are on the line, and uh, and MSK won the tag team titles. They're, they were the new champions. So uh, then, you know, a few days later, uh, Kimberly posts this, uh, she posts more, and, uh, and this would have been Monday or whatever, Sunday, Monday. I don't know the, I can't remember the exact timeline, but the point is, it was after they'd won the tag team titles. And uh, then Tuesday, I'm watching NXT, and uh, there's Nash Carter and Wes Lee. And they do a promo, and they're setting up a match for the following week. Then we're doing the show Wednesday, and we're interviewing Big Demo, and I start to get these messages. Nash Lee has been, or Nash Carter has been fired. And uh, once that happened, I was like, what is happening here? So, like... If I heard about these deleted tweets well over a week ago, where were you guys? You put the titles on him, and now you decide to fire him? So, uh, as it turns out, the the reason, apparently, and I've heard this from, from several people, the reason that he was actually fired had nothing to do with the allegations, but rather the photo. It says here he was dressed as Hitler, but in fact he was not wearing any clothes. Uh, that was apparently the reason that he was fired. Now, what I'm about to say, I don't want people jumping, all, oh, this is Brian's opinion. I'm telling you, I'm telling you what I've heard about this, okay? So don't get mad at me. What I was told is that the reason that they won the tag team titles this weekend, even though the allegations were out there, the reason that happened was because it was not believed that uh, Kimberly was reliable. That was what I was told. They did not believe her story. NXT, I don't know what kind of investigations they do or if they just talk. I don't know what happened. But whatever happened, they determined that she was not credible. That's why they put the tag team titles on MSK. Now, I don't know this 100%. But uh, everybody going into Saturday thought the Creed brothers were going to win. And uh, all I can tell you is that the Creeds were told to have your family at the show. So I think the Creeds also thought they were winning. And for whatever reason, they put the belts on MSK. So anyway, then we go to the, uh, then we go to the photograph. And, uh, you know, everyone's, you know, all over the photograph and everything like that. I don't know what happened with this photograph, Okay. But, and I have, n I have never done this, okay? And I think most people have not. But when I saw that photo, what I saw was, you know, this guy had a beard, and he decided he was going to shave his face. And, uh, you know, how many of us have shaved the face and left the big handlebar mustache or the Fu Manchu, or you leave some stupid hair thing on your face, and you take a picture of it, and then you finish shaving your face? I think that's what this guy did. I mean... Perhaps the guy is a, a Nazi. I don't know, okay? But I, I believe that's the context of this photograph, okay? He took a really stupid picture because he's an idiot and, uh, and apparently sent it to people, all right? I, personally, I... Tell me I'm wrong. I would be way more concerned about the allegations of abuse than a dumb person taking a dumb photograph. But... You know, they did whatever they were going to do, and they were more concerned about this photograph than the uh, the allegations of abuse. And so that's the story. That's apparently why he was fired. And uh, now there's like a whole bunch of stuff going on. They, they were breaking up uh, Imperium because I think the idea was it was going to be like Marcel Bartel and Walter or uh, Gunter going up to the main roster. And uh, poor Fabian Eichner was just going to be a singles guy in, in uh, NXT. And now, now that there is no more MSK, you know, I'm thinking that uh, Imperium may be staying down there. And now we've got vacant tag team titles. So, you know, whoever's going to win the tag titles, maybe the uh, Creeds can call their families again. But uh, the whole situation is just... I mean, it's mind-blowing to me. I heard that there are many people in, uh, in NXT that, uh, you know, they, they are on Nash Carter's side, for whatever you want to make of that. 
I also know there are a lot of people at NXT that when they put the titles on Nash Carter, they were like, what? I mean, this is a classic WWE. Why would you do this? But they did, and now they've they've paid for it. So that's that's what I can tell you about this story. But uh, what I can tell you is he's fired, and now they got to deal with uh, you know what they're going to do because they made these decisions. Well, was it a good decision for you that uh, the mother of your children come home yesterday and get you off the hook from all the stress and the the well, strain that you were under I, yesterday. I have no clue what this has to do with this story, but yes, life is it's much me better getting with away back. from that story because I don't know what I can really add to it. Well, hey, we point. can move on if because you want. Because it's so sloppy. Because it really is. Because at this point, it's it is he said, she said with pointing and bad decisions being made and all of these things playing out in front of our eyes, which are going to probably continue for a bit. So. I'm not sure what I can really add to either one of those stories to start with, including the Sunny one, which is just awful and tragic and terrible. It's just a uh, – there certainly was a WrestleMania uh, plunge and a hangover that, that took place, you know, <laughs> the high that people were on after some of the matches in the weekend. Uh, a lot of the crashing coming back down to earth with some of these stories. That NXT show, by the way. 631,000 viewers, up 0.8% from last week. 0.14, 18 to 49. So uh, the WrestleMania bump did not, uh, you know, it didn't help NXT. Apparently not a lot of people wanting to find out what happened at Stand and Deliver. And it didn't matter anyway because they just put everything back where it was before. So anyway, back in a moment with uh, the AEW report and more Observer Live. Hey, let's talk about this Dynamite show. Oh, what a great show this was. It opened up with Adam Cole and Christian, and uh, they had a great match because they are two excellent professional wrestlers. And the crowd, this crowd was so hot, not for the whole show, but for the stuff that they were super into. Holy smokes, they were super into it. And uh, they were going crazy for all the near falls at the end. And uh, finally... Uh, Adam Cole hits the boom and uh, pins him after raking his eyes. So uh, Hangman Page comes down to the ring and he does a promo. And essentially, Hangman Page has challenged Adam Cole to a world champion. He's going to put his title on the line on Rampage next week live. And it will be a Texas death match. So we're getting that one for free. It's not on Battle of the Belts. It is, uh, you hear that? It is the night before on Rampage. Hey, he said he wanted to add a little bit of icing to that cake now, didn't he, on Fridays? And he certainly did it with that. So he is loading it up pretty well here, isn't he? We had the Owen Hart Foundation Tournament Qualifier. Samoa Joe defeated Max Caster. And uh, Samoa Joe was so over, and he killed this guy. Max Caster, by the way, had one of his greatest raps. And uh, he knew it, too, because he looked in the camera and said, that was a good one, and it was. So anyway, I always love Max Caster raps, and I always love Max Caster getting massacred by some giant beast that was Samoa Joe. And, bro, he killed this guy. And uh, afterwards, Jay Lethal and Sanjay Dutt did a promo backstage, and they are challenging him. We're going to get a Samoa Joe J. Lethal match coming up here very, very soon. And I would like to mention that I, I had a tweet last night. I had the temerity to have an opinion on Twitter. I said, they fired Joe twice. And, of course, uh, you know, the stand-up folks, or as I I guess the new, to, uh, new uh, term is e-drones. I see that on my Twitter a lot. They all showed up and they, oh, you know, he also got hurt ten times in a year, blah, blah. Listen, you walnut-brained hadrosaurs. That's being nice. Listen, God bless the guy. I wish him the absolute best. But do you guys know who is injury-prone in WWE? Who's that? Way more than Samoa Joe ever was. Who? Well, you know, there was uh, Triple H, who was actually one of the more injury-prone guys that they ever had. I mean, we could talk about uh, Edge. You know, we could talk about... Uh, I mean, literally, I could go on and on and on and on about Undertaker. You know, guys who were more injury-prone than Joe ever was ever. But you know how it works, everybody. 
unless you're an e-drone. If you're injury prone and you're a tippy top guy, that's just the brakes. But if you're injury prone, you know, there are guys that are lower on the card that they get hurt once and they're branded injury prone and no one ever does anything with them again. Whereas if you're a top of the card guy, you can get hurt every week. And you just, uh, you know, but you're a star. Anyway, they announced that uh, it's Brian Danielson, Trent Beretta on Rampage, as well as John Moxley versus Wheeler Yuta. And uh, we will not, uh, maybe I'll have, uh, I'll have Fauntleroy read the lineup, but. Could you have Fauntleroy even if you do think, that part of John Moxley's promo? E- uh, please do that. Even if you think that uh, you know who would win this match, you need to watch it anyway. Because uh, it is, I got one after another, after another, after another. Uh, people, people called this the match of the year. So anyway, don't miss that one on Rampage. We had Sean Dean versus uh, Sean Spears. And of course, this was the segment where Wardlow showed up. And he brutalized and killed all these security guys. And then, uh, of course, Sean Spears was distracted. He was rolled up and pinned by Captain Sean Dean. And so next week, MJF will be facing Sean Dean again, who beat him earlier this year. He's going to attempt to get his revenge. The Wardlow thing is like, if you see a a dynamite lineup and there's a match that you're sure will die in the ratings, that's going to be the Wardlow segment. And it's going to get over every time. We had uh, clips of Eddie Kingston, Santana, and Ortiz beating up the Jericho Appreciation Society and sending them packing. That's going to set up a six-man. We'll do the lineups here in a while. Uh, Jade Cargill promo. The Hardys versus the Butcher and the Blade in a tables match. Uh, this was the uh, the portion of the show that was not good. I mean, they worked hard and all, but, you know, Matt Hardy is, uh, he's really beat up. And uh, Jeff is beat up. And uh, on top of, you know, the physical issues in this match, we also had the issue that it was a match where you had to put both members of a team through a table. But there's also no DQs. So they put Jeff through a table, then they put the Butcher through a table, then the Butcher just keeps beating up the Hardys, so then Jeff gets back involved. They're Like, they never went anywhere, they're still doing the match. And then finally the finish is Jeff Hardy, who was eliminated, put the blade through a table with a, you know, sent on off a ladder, and uh, that's the finish, which doesn't even make any sense. How does the eliminated guy... Anyway, this thing was kind of a total total mess in a train wreck. But, you know, when the fans, you know, when it was something the fans wanted to see from the Hardys, they went crazy for it. But uh, I, I, I cannot recommend uh, taking necessarily time out of your day to watch this match right here. Christian Cage stormed out of an interview with uh, Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus. Bro, it has to be coming soon. Has to. You understand? It's like the secret plan of Undertaker and Triple H to take out The Undertaker. We had a car sheet in Julia Hart. This was not good. Owen Hart Foundation tournament qualifier. I don't know what was going on, but like, you know, Julia Hart was not going up for anything. Poor Akaru Shida was like doing a powerlifting competition here. Every time she tried to lift her, it was a struggle. And uh, she won. So she moves on in the tournament. And then they had a stare down with her and uh, Serena Deeb. So uh, we'll have uh, Fauntleroy do uh, Rampage after the break. Uh, Dynamite next week, we have got uh, Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus versus Red Dragon for the titles. Titles are on the line. I would expect a title change. Eddie Kingston, Santana Ortiz versus Jericho Appreciation Society. Next week on Rampage, live, so I feel I can read this, it is Adam Page versus Adam Cole in a Texas death match. The day after, next Saturday, is the AEW Battle of the Belts, and the only match we have announced is Thunder Rosa versus Nyla Rose. Now, if you recall, uh, when uh, they had the thing with Cody, and then Sammy won the TNT title, and then I think Sammy immediately faced Cody. I forget what the situation was, but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if Red Dragon beat uh, Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy on Wednesday, and then they did the immediate rematch battle of the belts on saturday because we need some matches for battle of the belts they're doing all their championship matches not at battle with the belt or battle for the belts and then the main event dude i don't know what to say about this match other than i believe that um the young bucks are the greatest tag team of all time however 
the tag team of the year right now is absolutely FTR. Because, uh, you know, three of the best tag teams on the face of this planet all wrestled each other and did angles over the last five days. The Briscoes and FTR had a fantastic match. Then FTR goes and faces the Bucks, and they had a fantastic match. And if we get to see sometime soon the Young Bucks versus the Briscoes, you know what that's going to be? A fantastic match. But one of these teams had two of these matches within five days. They're FTR. So right now they're in their running. They're front runners for Tag Team of the Year. But the year, there's still much time left. But holy smokes, this match was so awesome. FTR won. They retained the Ring of Honor and AAA Tag Team titles. It was totally different from the Briscoes match. You know, the Briscoes match was a Briscoes match. This match was a Young Bucks match. And FTR can work a Briscoes match and a Young Bucks match. And also the Young Bucks can work a, work a Briscoes match and an FTR. Anyway, if we can get these three teams in a three-way, this was awesome. Just a fantastic match. So yeah, this was one of the best Dynamites ever. This was one of the best matches ever on Dynamite. So uh, I recommend going out of your way to uh, see this show if you've not already. It was awesome. Man, 160, 170 years of pro wrestling in this country. Out of all of those years, you believe the Young Bucks are the best tag team of all time? Oh, yeah. It's going to get people very upset with you. I don't care. I'll flip them over the other way. I don't even think they're in the top ten. Some people will say that's a big insult. The Look Young the Bucks aren't teams. in the top ten? I don't know. I Honestly, I well, don't know. Well, you just said that. Are they or well, not? For me, no. And here's why. Even of this generation, and again, it's all a matter of taste. You know, I, I'll I'll take the Briscoes. You know, I'll take the Briscoes over them for the entirety of, of what they're doing. Personally, I would take FTR over the Young Bucks and the Steiners, the Rock and Roll Express, Midnight Express, so many great tag teams over the years. Does it really matter anyway? The Young Bucks are going to be up there. They're going to be in the Hall of Fame, I believe, for the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. And I think the Briscoes are, too. Now, will FTR be there? They keep having matches like this. I hope that's the case. There are a lot of people that have been beating down the doors for them to be used better in the world of AEW and all the talent they have, all the teams that they have. You know, are they going to be able to get that rematch with the Young Bucks? What are we doing with this team? We want to see them. Now we've seen them against the Briscoes. We've seen them against the Young Bucks for their second time. And, yeah, I want to see more of that. I'd love to see them in the mix. I think it's great that FTR is in the mix to that level. And... I know Red Dragon's probably going to get their hands on the belts, but I uh, hope it's not too long before FDR actually has them again. Feedback after the break, Observer Live. I offered young Fauntleroy to come here and use the big boy mic, but he wasn't going to do it. And so, uh, in fact, he's not coming near me today for some reason, so I don't know what's up. But uh, he's ready for the Rampage uh, lineup. Not spoilers, it's the lineup, so... Uh, Fauntleroy, the uh, the floor is yours, young feller. Sa Twitch homies, John Mox 3 vs. Bira Yuta, Brian Danielson. You little idiot! God, doing it in Japanese. Sounds like Natsupoi. That's why he was staying away from me. <laughs> Fauntleroy, listen, if you're gonna do this, you gotta do it right. Otherwise, I'm gonna do it, and people get mad at me when I do it. I know you hate me now that you're a big star, but let's do this right. I'll give you one more chance. Here you go, Twitch homies. John Moxley versus Wheeler Yuta. Brian Danielson versus Trent Beretta. Owen Hart qualifier. Red Velvet versus Willow Nightingale. Swerve Strickland versus QT Marshall. All right, there you go. What's up with your audio today, Fauntleroy? That sounded horrible. <laughs> what was that? By the way, hey. If you're willing, I'll take a photo and we'll put it up. Because right now you're giraffe. We'll see if he'll at least let me take a photo. Who are you talking to, Fauntleroy? Fauntleroy. Okay. I'm going to get him on the air one of these days. You guys think I'm joking. He's shy, though. Are you sure you're going to be able to? It's going to take a lot of convincing. Bro, I don't know if you're aware of this or not. Clearly not. But Tuesday on the Brian and Vinny and Granny and Craig show, I got Granny on video. I've heard this. 92 years old. How's that working out for you? It was great. It went perfect. How about for her? Went off without a hit. She enjoyed it. It was awesome. And listen, I I am asking, 
Can anybody find me an example of a 92-year-old woman who is doing a weekly video podcast? Find one. I'd like to get her in the Guinness Book of World Records. <laughs> I have a lot she of jokes to say, for some I always thought people, I'd be but... famous. That's what she says. So we're going to make her famous. We're going to get her in that Guinness Book. If she Natalia can be in now? there. <laughs> she, she thinks she's famous now? Of course that she's woman... famous. Mike, don't make me mute say, you. You please. kayfabe killing. <laughs> All right. Can we, uh, can we get going here? Hey, speaking of kayfabe killing <laughs> or the possibility of it, what do you think about Jade Cargill and Marina Shafir? Because I like Marina Shafir a lot as far as her developing into a more consistent and better professional style of wrestler. And we see what she does in blood sports. She's been fantastic in those sorts of situations, but her and Jade Cargill is not a natural matchup. And I'm curious as to what you think about it. Do you think they've been working on it? And if they have been working on it, do you they think better be, be working on it. Do you think they'll be a little bit better than Lash Legend and Nikita Lyons, which was apparently being worked on for, quote, weeks? Yeah, I do want to apologize because uh, on, when I did the report yesterday, I said that they practiced all week, and I was wrong. They actually practiced for multiple weeks to do that match. For so, real. <laughs> Supposedly. Here's the thing. Allegedly. Here's the thing, everybody. Listen. <laughs> okay. One of the most famous matches... In all of uh, in all of WrestleMania history, was that Randy Savage and Ricky Steamboat match, and uh, that was that was literally move for move. They they had the whole thing written down. Each each move was assigned a number, and uh, they memorized it. And also they they uh, would quiz each other. You know, they'd be on the plane or whatever, and Randy would walk by to get something and go. You know, whatever. 22! And then uh, Steamboat would have to say, arm drag! Luckily, he did a lot of arm drag, so, you know. But anyway, and then, you know, there were a lot of those famous Misawa, Kawada, Kobashi tag matches. And uh, I don't know if it's true, but, like, I was always told that a lot of those great all-Japan matches that are all-time classics that people talk about to this day, I mean, they were largely, like, you know, start to finish. That was scripted. Maybe scripted is the wrong word or whatever. Uh, but now, granted, they, they, you know, Savage and Steamboat weren't, you know, at a warehouse somewhere, you know, going over it over and over and over and over and over and over again. But, uh, you know, my point is this. And I saw the same thing with a lot of Dallas Page matches, and there have been others as well. If I, as a fan, am, uh, you know, buying my ticket for a show, and I'm going to show up and a match is advertised... I would like it to be a good match, okay? And if the only way it's going to be good is if they practice it for weeks, fine, okay? I'd prefer that over, you know, watching an absolutely horrible match because they totally suck and et cetera, et cetera. So I don't have a problem with going in there and practicing for three weeks so you can go on national television and go two minutes and it's not embarrassing. But you're not going to learn how to work. And the bigger issue of of uh, not being able to learn how to work is, you know, I, I guess if we live in a world where you're only going to put Lash Legend in a match every four weeks, and then, you know, she's going to practice for three weeks and then go and tell, fine, okay? But, like, even nowadays where you're not doing four nights a week on the road and everything like that, and not everybody needs to work every Raw and SmackDown, the fact of the matter is, you know, this this crazy bloke at the top, I mean, he changes his mind all the time. and uh, And you need to be able to show up at the show, and be told we're doing something totally different than what you were expecting, okay? Maybe it's not that, even though it was that way in NXT this weekend, but, you know, maybe most of the time they advertise a match for NXT and they do it because Vince is in there rewriting everything. But if she ever is going to go to the main roster, she needs to be prepared that she's going to show up at 1, expecting to work Carmella, and by 5, she's going to be working Zelina. And they're going to have, you know, three hours to get that match together and ready to go. So... You know, there's two sides to this thing. One, thank God they didn't have a horrible match. Thank God no one died. Thank God it was, like, fine, you know, per the standards except, expected for that match. But you need to be way better than that. you got to be able to go in there with three hours' notice and do a match. So I guess that's what developmental's for. Well, Jade Cargill's developing on national TV and... I, yeah, I'm, I'm interested with this thing with Shafir. I'm interested with Jade Cargill as far as being a heel because she's a good one. She really is. But with the baddie section, with this 
awkward relationship at, at times with her lawyer, Smart Mark Sterling. It's like, man, she's a baby face. She's going to be a baby face one day. And I thought Marina Shafir down the line could be somebody who could come in and be kind of dangerous. You know, you have your Masha Slamoviches and your your people like that. I think she would, or, uh, you know, Layla Hirsch's and people like that. I think she would blend right in with, but she's not a refined pro wrestler yet. And I'm surprised they're actually doing this match as a 30th match and as a showcase for Cargill because it's like, I mean, we know for real, I mean, no offense to a bodybuilder and, and their fight skills, but I know what Marina Shafir can probably do to somebody who's a bodybuilder and a bodybuilder alone. And it's like, okay, how do we put a realistic spin on this Jay Cargill thing? And how I wonder how we can make it where it's going to be good because they are kind of building up to it. And anything Jade's in is a high profile thing. I'm really interested in how that match is going to be because it ends if it ends up being good. Like, really, like, wow, good. You know, it'll be interesting to see, again, how, who gets credit for that and how it goes. But it's, do you, if, if, if it's up to you, do you get rid of this winning streak now from Cargill? No, why? Okay, so you just do great it? numbers. Well, I'm just curious as to if you add some drama in there and you, you know, you go to a draw with somebody. So technically it's out of the way and it's not as important to every single story of her winning. Or is that what this is all about? Because there's a zillion women you could have brought in and a zillion people other than like a Shafir and people like that, that you could have brought in to kind of like build up a record. But they don't seem to be doing that as much now. Everything she's in is a feature and they seem to kind of want a name in there that matches up. Well, it's you because know? we're about to do number three. 30. Like after she gets 30, she can go win some matches on dark again to, to pad her record. But everything in wrestling is when it's time. And when I look at the numbers that Jade Cargill does, when I look at the reaction she gets in no universe, is it time to beat her right now? Let her go. Let her beat Marina Shafir down the road. If, if things aren't working, if they're slowing down, if people don't care, then you can beat her and do a story, but don't do it now. Wait. How, how long do you go with it? You go, 15? I don't know when it's time. <laughs> Do I need to get Buddy on the show? If I could, I would. When uh, it's time, and it's not time right now. You'll know when it's time. It'll feel like it. You know what it's time to do? Maybe turn Ty Conti and uh, Sammy. Because uh, I guess it's sort of a spoiler, but not really. They do a segment on Dynamite. They're, they're booed. And you knew it was coming. Although, as Dagan noted here, they did, uh, they did come out, and uh, they do the thing during the commercial break where they hold up the signs. And uh, they weren't booed then. Crowd cheered them like crazy when they were doing those signs. But later, when they were uh, going back and forth, uh, they do a segment on on Rampage, and they they got booed. And by the way, it was also brought to my attention. And when it comes to uh, you know, you know, have a good match, however you have to do it, but you need to learn how to work. And granted, this is an extreme example, but uh, Speedball Mike Bailey. My less handsome doppelganger. You know, that guy had nine matches over WrestleMania weekend. Nine. Well, you can't do nine matches with nine randos if you got to practice every one of those matches for three weeks. You got to be able to show up at the building. You know who you're working. And not only that, you got to like work. And then sometimes you got to work and then get out of that building because you got to run across the street to another show. With some other rando, and now you got 15 minutes before you got to be in the ring. I mean, my match with uh, Orange Cassidy was not like match of the year or anything like that, but literally, it was Orange Cassidy. So I showed up at the building, and he wasn't even there. So I waited around, and I waited around, and finally the guy showed up. We had like 20 minutes before the show started. I think we were on like first or second or something like that. Maybe not, but the point is we had almost no time to go over anything. And uh, that's what happens sometimes. You have to be able to... Go in there and go. Weeks. Weeks. You think of everything cosmic. I was on second, and, thank you. And you were coming around at this time. How many matches do you think you could pull off? If you remember your your most uh the the, the most vim and vigor that your body ever had. What are had you talking in, about? How many matches could I do right now? How many now matches on a weekend? do you think you would have on a WrestleMania weekend? People making six, well, seven, eight. It depends eight shots. on the match. How many bumps do I have to take? Who's who am I working with? Am I working with the Rock and Roll Express or am I working with the Briscoes? If I'm working with the Briscoes, I'll probably never have a match again after that one. May not even make it out. If I'm working the Rock and Roll Express, I could probably work them twice a day for three straight days. <laughs> it all depends. 
There's no easy answer to this question. But I would bet that Mike Bailey was working some hard matches. What do we got here in this, uh, in this thing? On this date in 1986, Steven says, you want some history? This was the day when pro wrestling presented the original wardrobe malfunction. Velvet McIntyre was challenging Moolah for the WWF women's title. Like so many times before, Velvet dies off the second rope to splash her opponent. Like so many times before, the opponent moves and Velvet hits nothing. On this one evening, her left shoulder strap snaps and those close to ringside may have seen more than pro wrestling. Moolah immediately went for the cover. The ref jumps into position. The count hit three, match over. This was at the Rosemont Horizon, part of WrestleMania II. It was the first time the annual event was held on a Monday. The first and only time the annual event was held at more than one venue. It was a quick match, but still a moment in history. That's from Steven in Atlanta. It was a forgotten moment in history. The Monday pay-per-view, which was a piggyback off of boxing where you go to a destination, you go to your spot like in Vegas, you got all weekend to gamble, and then Monday you see the the big event and then you get out of there. It's completely reversed now. You come in on a Friday night, you have the event on Saturday, and then you party all night, you get out of there on Sunday. But that's one of the reasons that they decided to go with that idea. A logistical nightmare. I remember those talking about it, those involved in it. Chicago, Los Angeles, and Long Island. A uh, unique idea for WrestleMania II that went so well it was never tried again. Yes, and uh, we have uh, have a question here in the update on the Layla Hirsch injury last night. Looked pretty bad live. I have not heard an update, but you know what I'm going to try and do? Get one during the break. Back in a moment, Observer Live. I'm Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. No news at the moment. Hopefully we'll find out soon how uh, how Layla's doing. But it uh, doesn't look like she's updated her to Twitter or anything like that. So uh, it's hard to tell if no news is good news or... Actually, we have no idea, so we'll just wait. Hopefully we'll have an update in the daily update today. But uh, tonight on the Brian and Vinny show will, in fact, be myself and Vinny recapping all of AEW and NXT. So don't do the usual, Oh, Bright forgot to talk about... Yes, I did. I had 12 minutes to do that report. But tonight, I have 90. So, we'll uh, talk about NXT 2.0 and Dynamite. So make sure you check that out. And don't forget to grab your cameos, everybody. F4W Online on Cameo. Birthdays and pep talks. And uh, I've done dieting advice. I've done it all. I've done it all. Did you just yell at him to just stop eating? <laughs> I've reviewed like uh, sh- very short matches. If your match is more than like five minutes, I'm not. I'm not going to review it. Involving Marco Stunt and Brian Alvarez. No. Oh man, I should do a promo promo on Marco's dad. I do that one for free. Anyway. That's it. We're going to wrap it up. I want to thank Mike as always, callers and listeners, everybody in the studio, Twitch homies. Thank you, Dagan, for the Twitch homies sign yesterday at Dynamite. Most, some of you on YouTube. Anyway, we'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.